Its own discoverer calls it a spectacular virus, one of the most lethal, and now out of control in West Africa, according to Médecins Sans Frontières, where the deadliest outbreak on record is spreading like wildfire. And it is gruesome. Most of those who get it will die through uncontrollable bleeding, as hundreds are now succumbing in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia.
good evening. Uh, my name is Leilani Dow. I'm with the International Action Center, and I'll be one of the co-chairs for tonight. Um, so first, first and foremost, we want to um, really um, express our thanks and appreciation to the National Black Theater for uh, hosting this event tonight and um, really supporting it. And we wanted to point out that the event is being live streamed. As so, as you all are here, there are um, people around around the country watching this as well, and um, will be participating, you know, through through live stream. Um, so we're here today to to uh, you know organize and to demand justice in the Ebola, Ebola epidemic. Um, we want to demand uh, equal, adequate health health care. We want to demand real support for the people of Africa and not troops and not war. And the, the money that's being spent for war is being spent to, to deal with this crisis. Um, we, of course, also have to point out that we are here less than a week after the infuriating racist refusal of the grand jury to convict Eric Garner's killer, his murderer. Uh, you know, there's a large West Afri African community in Staten Island that is affected by both uh, the Ebola crisis and the continued racist police brutality that affects, you know, Staten Island, all the five boroughs of New York, this entire country. Um, this meeting is, as everyone knows, less than two weeks after the unjust verdict on Mike Brown, on Ferguson, you know, who they left to die, just like they left uh, Thomas Eric, Eric Duncan to die in Dallas when they turned him away from the hospital on a stretcher on his first visit when he, um, around, when he, um, and, and refused to diagnose him until much later around Ebola. Um, you know, just like they've prioritized in, in the initial, uh, in the initial crisis, just as they prioritize sending troops to Africa, they militarize our communities. Um, and we, of course, haven't forgotten the murders of Amadou Diallo and Usmani Zongo, two West Africans also killed by the New York Police Department uh, here in New York. And, you know, all of this goes back to the legacy, of course, of slavery and colonialism uh, set out when, when the colonialists and the capitalists set out on their project to mark our lives as dispensable, to mark our bodies as good only for labor. Africa and the African diaspora desperately need and desperately deserve reparations and an end to the hundreds of years of policies of repression, of discrimination, and of murder. Um, so we are here today to make that demand and to continue the, the, the struggle that, is ha that has continued since those beginnings. Um, and in that light, I'd like, I'd like to call your attention to two upcoming events. Um, on Thursday, there will be a protest from 1 to 3. Uh, our illustrious police chief, Bratton, is receiving an award, so we will be there to express our outrage at 88th Fifth Avenue. And then, of course, Saturday, there's a Millions March Against Injustice happening in Washington Square Park at 2 p.m. I hope everyone was able to get a flyer as they came in. Um, so, we, you know, we want to open this with talking, you know, with making everyone aware that the struggle will continue. You know, we're, started, we're, we're starting here, we're continuing on. Um, so we just wanted to highlight those before we get started. Um, I'd like to introduce my next, my co-chair, um, Toba Port, who is from the Staten Island Liberian Community Association. If I may ask for a personal privilege, I will ask us to please stand for a moment of silent in recognition of all our sisters and brothers who've died from Ebola and all of our sisters and brothers who have been brutalized by the hands of police. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank our sister Linani for the introduction and I'm so happy to be here this evening with our sisters and brothers on this side of the world. My name is Togba Aokriyi Port. I'm a, mem I'm a Liberian who came to America some 24 years ago, and uh, I've happened to live in both worlds. In Liberia, we say, your hello, and then you respond by hello. That's a great thing in Liberia. We say, your hello, your hello. In Sierra Leone, we say, how you do, my uh, Bobo, how you doing? And they say, how you doing back? And in Guinea, they say, Nura, meaning good evening or hello. And, but in Liberia, we call our community to order by saying, 
If Liberians are in the house, please respond to me. Yo, yo. Yo, yo. Yo, yo. That means nobody is sleeping in the house and nobody is sleeping in the village. So we call you to the African village this evening, year in the African village in New York. Uh, the, 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 the video you saw this evening was a video produced by a young and talented Liberian R&B singer, now turned an advocate for Ebola, Mr. David Mel. He will be here tonight performing. So let's give it up for David Mel once more. Today, I was asked by the Liberian president, uh, Mrs. Orita Bestman, yes, and Johnny Stevens, our friend, and uh, members of the Guinean community and the Sierra Leonean community to be a host for this uh, program also. And it's my privilege to, chair, to, to share the stage with Lenani Dao, Dao, a powerful international action center uh, personality. Uh, it is my honor to be here this evening with you all. I'd just like to speak for a little bit on the Ebola crisis in Africa, especially in the three countries, Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. Remember that these three countries have gone under, for the last 20 or 25 years, on a, a real or brutal civil war in all three of these countries. Infrastructure broke down. Everything, when I mean infrastructure, especially in Liberia, our roads, our hospitals, our, our governmental institution, our, our, our people's lives, in Liberian civil war, I believe over 450,000 people died in that civil war. It was brothers fighting against brothers, mothers fighting against your children. That's the kind of war we went through. Same thing in Sierra Leone, same thing in Guinea. Unfortunately for us, uh, I mean for all of us, we just didn't break the fabric of our country, but we, break, we broke the institution, we broke the, the infrastructure, we broke the very lifeline of our country. Then what happened? 20 years later, we come to face a disease that not even America or the international community or all of the health practitioners around the world could not even deal with. So how could Africa, a country, a continent, countries that their infrastructure have broken down, how could they deal with this disease? It is estimated, it's said recently when we had the Ebola crisis here with uh, the doctors, uh, thank God that he said, well, they said it will cost them at least $20,000 a day to take care of one Ebola patient. The, the um, national budget of Liberia, yearly budget is $650 million. And in these crises, all of our economic structure has broken down. We're losing not only money, but we're losing the lives of our future. That's what's happening across West Africa. And I'm happy that you, my brothers and sisters tonight, who are sitting here, who are also activists, understand this plight. We're not gonna give up. And then we, we begin to get stigmatized, even in the country that we have adopted, in other parts of the world. If you're an African, your fellow brothers and sisters of the world, because we African consider the world a village, don't wanna sit by you. They don't wanna work with you. <laughs> they, 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 they back off a little bit like I said to say you're a disease. That's what our brothers and sisters from Africa, from Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and now Mali. A matter of fact, the African continent as a whole. And maybe you are brothers and sisters here who have the African color are going through. But this disease is not a color disease. You know it from first-hand information from the doctors who've come, who have come back here and been cured. It is not a border disease. It is not a country disease. It's an international disease. It's an international epidemic. And except the international community rally to bring a cure to this disease, this is going to become a world, this is going to be a worldwide epidemic. There's no mistaking about it because, again, remember, we are living in a village. And in villages, we knock on people's doors, say hi, and ask them for food, and eat together. You don't know who your friend in that village or your sister in that village will bring that disease right to your door. So don't think it can't happen here. It's already happened here. 
And until we find a cure for it, it will happen here. So tonight I want to applaud all of us for taking away your busy time to come this evening for us to share ideas on how we are going to fight this disease. What I have decided to do in January, there's going to be a YouTube video coming up that I have made a pledge to grow my beard until we find a cure to the threat of Ebola in West Africa and around the world. So every month, you'll see a new picture of my beard. Until we reach that plight, my beard will continue to grow. My wife might not like it. Some friends might not be comfortable with me. But what's going to make me happy is when Africa and the world is eradicated from Ebola. So let us do this. Let us start this meeting and let me have the opportunity at this time to introduce to you uh, a gentleman from Sierra Leone, our next door neighbor, uh, a man who I've had the privilege to work with in the, in the African community on Staten Island for at least 10 or more years. Please put your hands together for our brother, Mr. Said Kurma, who is going to speak to us from the Sierra Leone community of Staten Island. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I want to first of all extend our sincere thanks to the organizers of this assembly. I also want to thank the entire population around here, because every time when we think about Africa, we think about Harlem. We almost carry the same type of uh, things that we do back home. <clears throat> My name is uh, Sahid, as the chairman said. I live on Staten Island. I came to this, to, uh, to this country uh, since 1979, and I've been here peacefully. Uh, <clears throat> the video has said it all. The only question I have right now is how, what do we do? What do we do? We have to fight this. It's a war. And when I mean a war, it's a quiet war. Nobody knows. We as Africans, we, we, never, we never had the opportunity to face this kind of a disease. We don't know where it came from, but now our people are dying. Uh, I just want to give you a little uh, gist about Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone is a population of uh, 6 million plus people. <clears throat> then we're in between Liberia and Guinea. Liberia is on the uh, su southeast, and uh, the Republic of Guinea is on the uh, northeast. So we are right in between, just like when you have New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey. So whatever comes to Liberia flows to Frita, to Sierra Leone, and from Sierra Leone is going to flow to, uh, to Guinea. Okay, as um, of now, the question is going to remain, what do we do? As far as, uh, I just want to give you a little figure of uh, what is happening in Sierra Leone. So far, so good. Um, we have, a, we have a population of uh, the people who have actually suffered from this Ebola, about 6,201 people. These are reported cases, and uh, over, over two, almost 2,000 dollars, I mean, almost 2,000 people have died, including 10 doctors, and over 20 nurses. So we, as Sierra Leoneans, I'm representing the United States Sierra Leonean Association, which is stationed in Staten Island. Um, we're asking you all to help us find a way. Either whatever way we find. We depend on you people, and we expect good results to come after. We have a non-profit organization based in Staten Island. 
And we're not just sitting down waiting for people to come help us. We've been trying to help ourselves. It's the disease is not just the Ebola that is killing the people in Sierra Leone or in West Africa. It's hunger. Because when they suspect that you have the virus, the, the, the present position right now is when you have fever, you have anything that is part of the symptoms of Ebola, they're going to quarantine you. Whether it's Ebola or not, they put you somewhere. And when they put that mixture of those who have Ebola and those who don't have Ebola, then you end up catching Ebola. Now it's hunger that is killing them. Because when they put you somewhere, you cannot come outside and there is not enough food to feed you. The next thing you do is you get sick and you die. So as, an, uh, as a non-profit organization that we have for the past eight years, we recently uh, shipped some food stuff, which is like 50 bags of rice, uh, 50 bags of everything you can think of. So the distribution is going to be this Friday and Saturday back home in Sierra Leone. We line up, we decided to not even involve the government. This is on our own, because we wanted to get to the people that have needed. So I'm asking each and every one of you here, uh, as good Samaritans, we need that help. Thank you. Uh, they just said my time is up. Thank you. <laughs> What a nice way to say your time is up with the talking drums. <laughs> oh, sisters and brothers, you, I hope you don't mind if I call you sisters and brothers. I'm, I'm from the Union world, and in, in Africa, we are all sisters and brothers. So it makes it a, a, a stronger uh, look, and I believe that we're in a village. I want to thank Mr. Saidu from the uh, Union of the Sierra Leone Association in, America, in, in Staten Island for that wonderful talk and I hope that you take note and after the program you can speak to him about further information on what they're doing. At this time we're going to move on to the program and uh, I'm going to introduce to you a dynamic speaker from the National Board Veterans for Peace, uh, the director of the Urban Issues Institute, SSCCC. Uh, this person I believe this is, she's going to wake us up from our sleep, so I, uh, I hope you're ready for her. Uh, please welcome Dr. Margaret Stevens. Yeah, I wouldn't have worn the heels if I knew I was gonna be standing, but that's okay. Um, so, um, I'll maybe borrow the two minutes of the person who spoke for three minutes so that we can have seven minutes because we have a lot to talk about. Now, nah, yeah, I won't talk too much, don't worry. Um, on, in September, I took a trip to um, Washington, D.C. with Michael Gray, who uh, is head of foreign relations for Congressman Payne's office in New Jersey. Michael Gray is um, a librarian. He's also an advocate for his community. I'm sure many people here are familiar with him from the Liberian community. So we took a trip to DC with a group of Sierra Leoneans and um, Guineans. And um, uh, we met, uh, we had a couple Congress people speak, and then there was a man from the USAID who spoke as well. And I just want to, what happened is that briefly, he spoke about, um, this was all about the Ebola outbreak, and, the, and the, the, the man from the USAID was so proud to announce the fact that he had just heard that uh, USAID was going to offer 400 beds for the people of Liberia for the Ebola outbreak, and that 100 beds were going to be placed in four separate soccer arenas, and that these 100 beds were really going to help do something about the outbreak. And on top of the 100 beds, he had 200,000 home protection kits that the people would have so that they could help care for their family members who were getting sick. And a home protection kit is latex gloves and like a little vest or like a little, um, you know, plastic apron. Coming from the U.S. Right. This is the same country that can afford to send people to explore stuff far away in outer space, not on the planet, right? This is the same country 
that has billions of dollars to build new 9-11 buildings in 10 years. This is the same United States, right? But they were so proud to announce these 400 beds and these protection kits in soccer arenas in a country where a soccer arena is not like the, it's not like the Madison Square Gardens, right? So the fact that this was the best they could come up with, and he was proud to announce this, and the fact that this is the same USAID that's basically a humanitarian arm of the United States military, which basically means they go into many of the regions of the world where the United States has strategic interests, and then they do good deeds for the local people and basically help implement United States military infrastructure wherever they go. So whether it's Central America, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's Africa, the United US aid is just a certain form of US military expansion and intervention around the world. So they come bragging about what they're going to do in a group like this full of African people back in September. So that shows you the negligence that we're talking about. And it's not like this negligence is just by mistake, right? This negligence is is representation of the fact that Africa for the past 500 years has been nothing more for the ruling classes of this world as a resource for labor. It's been nothing more than a site of extracting mass wealth, whether it's the diamonds, whether it's the rubber, whether it's you know the gold, whatever resources they have, and the humans have only been a means of extracting that labor. And so that's where this systematic negligence comes from. It doesn't just happen because of bad leaders. It's not just because President Obama doesn't care. So we need to be very clear as to why the United States can be so cavalier about the deaths of these people. And you know, from the political economic perspective, you know, when we think about Africa, we ha what we have to also understand at this moment in history is that not only is Africa, you know, a strategic point for the expansion of capitalism for countries like China, who see Africa as a very important pool of labor and also sites where they can set up their own infrastructures and factories and plants to extract resources from Africa, but as workers from different populations around the world no longer become the, 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 the choice of industrialists to expand, right now it's China, there are new sites where human labor can be extrapolated from. And in many ways, Africa continues, in my opinion, as far as I see it, to be a reserve army of humans who this racist system around the world has always seen as a site where maybe we'll expand there 50, 20, 30 years down the line. Maybe that'll be an important military strategic location if we want to bomb the Middle East or bomb other parts of the world. So when we talk about trying to do something about Ebola, we have to understand that as humans and as people who care about people all over the world, we're doing this not just because we feel bad, not just because what's happening is inhumane, but because it's not a sustainable way to organize our human society to allow millions of people in parts around the world to just go extinct. It's not a sustainable form of human existence, but it is the form of existence that's winning right now. So what they're not telling us is that many of the people who are going out to West Africa are from Cuba, right? The socialist countries, those are the people sending their doctors out there to do something about this. Doctors Without Borders, which comes from mainly, you know, Western capitalist countries, they also do a really great job as much as they can, but they're underfunded, they're understaffed, they don't get the resources they need. So, I mean, I'm pretty sure you can get my point, and my point is that we live in a world where human life is not the paramount goal, it's not the paramount value, it's wealth and it's profit that's the paramount value. And when we live in a world like that, well, the Mike Browns of the world will continue to be hung, right? They lynched us 100 years ago and they continue to lynch us today because that's the nature of this unequal society that we live in here. There are many people who aren't necessary in this country that we live in right here. So there are parallels between the needless deaths of people in West Africa from a virus that can be contained. And I agree with you that the infrastructure is poor. When he says that the infrastructure is poor just from another word, what that means is that 
If you get a shipment of supplies that just came from the Red Cross and it comes to the port of Liberia, the problem is how are you going to get those goods to the inner central districts of some of these cities where the roads are so damaged that getting the goods there is a problem? How the infrastructure is so damaged that there's no surveillance so that by the time you try to get the goods to the villages where the people are suffering, 90% of those resources have been stolen by the wealthy who took the best supplies to fund their private clinics. So even though those resources were supposed to go to the poor, they don't make it to the poor. And I know this not just from making this up, I was in Haiti. And I saw this happen after the earthquake, when all the hospital workers in Haiti were like, you're leaving us with nothing. People are dying from this earthquake, and we can't even provide for them as nurses and doctors because all of the stuff that's being donated to us is being stolen by the wealthy for their private clinics. So it's not just Haiti, it's not just West Africa, it's also the Philippines. My student here from the Philippines who's, you know, I know people who lost family members because of the typhoon that hit several years ago. People who live on shores by beaches because that's the least valuable land so they don't live far enough away from the shore. So when the oceans and the waves come, they destroy everybody who lives two miles from the shore. That's systematic gross negligence of human life all over the world. So I see that my time is up. I came all the way here from New Jersey. We got in the car at 3.30 in the afternoon. But the point is that, you know, you've really got to understand that when you want to allow for the type of theoretical organizing that's necessary to take this stuff to the next level, you know, you have to provide the spaces where that people can lay this stuff out and you can leave with concrete actions. So for example, one of the concrete things that we're doing at Essex County College is a group of us is supposed to be um, doing some radio um, lesson plans for many of the students in some of these countries um, where the colleges have shut down, they've stopped teaching because of the outbreak. So what uh, we heard that what they're doing in um, Africa to carry on the lesson plans is they're using the radio. So people are staying in their homes and the students are trying to learn by listening to the radio. So a group of us were thinking if we create lesson plans and then deliver them you know, over the radio airwaves, then they can still continue to receive some education you know, without having to leave their homes. So we have to figure out creative ways like that to turn a negative into a positive. But as long as we continue to buy into this idea that that's your country, your country, that's your hood, this is my hood, this is my country, those are my people, when the, the diseases don't respect the borders. We're the only ones that respect the borders and the borders don't help us. They only help the wealthy. So until we start to think in a more sophisticated manner than the people with more power than us, we really won't win. So we've got to take that type of approach very seriously, and I'm happy that you brought me here today to make that point. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Um, our next speaker is from a coalition that has done a lot of work over the years around another epidemic, um, and that would be the, uh, the AIDS epidemic, and um, you know, is, has stepped up again for this issue. So please welcome Marcelo Maya from ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power in New York. Thank you very much for this opportunity of speaking here. Uh, when Ebola uh, surfaced and we saw the reaction from mainly from politicians here in the United States, uh, we immediately made the connection on how these politicians react when AIDS or HIV surfaced here. The, the fear-based politics, the um, a stigma that start being generated in, uh, around Ebola was so closely uh, associated with HIV that affected us immediately. So uh, we created a group on ECTAP to do specifically with Ebola, and it's like a, a think tank and has uh, people from different organizations, including Medicine Sans Frontier and uh, treatment action groups and, and, and people from ACTAP too. 
the the uh, I really like what you said about Ebola affecting the other. It's not just the other. It's in another country, in another hemisphere, uh, in in another continent. So uh, this idea of the other, we are all others. We are others for the person next to us. The idea that it's something that's not going to affect us is a really wrong idea. Um, but it became kind of difficult to uh, f realize how we're going to respond to this. For instance, when uh, politicians in the early 90s, like Jesse Helms, start uh, spreading homophobic messages and trying to cut money to uh, HIV prevention and care and treatment, act up. Uh, put a group together and traveled to Arlington where Jesse Helms had a house and we dressed his house with a huge condom. The whole house was covered with the condom. It was visually a very strong message and very effective way of uh, carrying on a protest. Mm -hmm. What we do with Ebola when the same thing here happened when Governor Cuomo and Governor Christie just before the elections and because this was a popular measure, they decided to uh, impose a mandatory quarantine for people who are going to Africa, to West Africa, as volunteers to try to help people there. This created a reaction act up that we, we, we saw that we had to act immediately. At that time, Dr. Spencer had just been admitted to Bellevue Hospital and we had our first demonstration there. Around 60 people came, and we uh, had people speaking in front of Bellevue in support of the healthcare professionals, which were being stigmatized, and of course also the people from these countries, which uh, were dealing directly with the problem. We marched from Bellevue to the governor's office. Um, it becomes now a, a problem how to follow up, how to continue with demonstrations to keep this issue up. Because another thing that's happening, Ebola seems to be not a problem anymore. It's not on the news anymore. It's, again, a problem that is affecting somebody else. It's not our problem. Uh, the way of uh, combating this is to really disseminating information. ACTAP has prepared uh, a, uh, a fact sheet about Ebola. It's on the table on the back over there. It has our contact information, and we meet every Monday night at the LGBT Center. We've been meeting there since 1987. Um, we'd like to invite all of you who would like to come to ACTAP, and uh, the ACTAP Ebola group meets uh, at 6 o'clock, just before our general meeting. Um, uh, my main interest in getting involved on this issue is really to combat the stigma. The stigma is, is, uh, feeds the epidemic. It fed the, the HIV epidemic and it still feeds it. Uh, the stigma caused uh, the United States to create a travel and immigration ban, which lasts for two decades. When this ban was created, there were like a few thousand cases of HIV and AIDS in the United States. When the ban was lifted, there was over a million cases. So it's a totally ineffective way of dealing with an epidemic. Fear is not going to stop anything. It's just, and, and, and when it's used for political purpose, uh, it, it really creates the politician, gives him an image of, I don't even know what to call it, uh, an opportunistic person. Uh, I think we should continue hammering both New Jersey governor and New York governor so they lift this mandatory uh, quarantine, which uh, we saw how the nurse in New Jersey and uh, how she was being treated, I mean, having to use a pot body. Uh, 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 I don't know uh, exactly, I mean, I don't think anybody has the answer, but we need, if you want to do anything, if you want to create change, you need to get together with a group, an organization that's working on this issue, 
and I'm sure that there are several around there that you can choose from and get involved and try to do something. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. Um, as been mentioned, and has been mentioned earlier, uh, some of the one of the countries providing the most support and aid for the Ebola crisis is Cuba, of course. And it is my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce Gail Walker from the Interreligious Foundation for Community Organizing, which routinely organizes um, solidarity delegations to Cuba. So, Gail Walker. Thank you, and thank you all for being here tonight. I keep looking up at this banner, Money for Ebola, Not Wars, Black Lives Matter, from West Africa to Staten Island to Ferguson. Says it all. Hi, Margaret. Um, you know, the outrage that has gripped this city and communities across the globe following the swath of killings of unarmed black men at the hands of racist police has underscored the message that black lives matter, and perhaps now more than ever. So as we all know, long before Amadou Diallo or Sean Bell or Oscar Grant, Trayvon Martin, Jordan Mar uh, Davis, Michael Brown, long before Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, long before Akai Gurley, there was Emmett Till and James Ch Cheney. And some of you might remember James Byrd, the black man who was chained to the back of a pickup truck and dragged for three miles to his death. We can't allow this to continue. And we're here to talk about the crisis that our brothers and sisters in Africa in particular are, are faced with at this point, but there's, there's a direct link and we can never forget that. Um, I'm excited to see the number of people who've been out on the streets night after night to really draw attention to this injustice. And we've got to continue to support them and especially the young people, the young activists who are making those kind of connections between the senseless murders and this continued racial profiling of our Muslim brothers and sisters and the tragic deaths of our African brothers and sisters from Ebola. So yes, my friends, black lives do matter. And we cannot allow our African family members to be stigmatized, as has been uh, stated, uh, by this deadly disease. Uh, but I want to just take a moment to talk a little bit about uh, Cuba. Um, it's been mentioned that Cuba has been on the, uh, uh, the front line, really, in this fight. And um, I think we have to take time to thank those who have been brave enough to run toward the fight, to run toward the fight while so many in the world are running from it. And um, our Cuban comrades who have been on the front line in this uh, fight uh, really deserve um, praise. Despite the attempts by the mainstream media to uh, ignore Cuba's presence in West Africa. The world is watching, and uh, there's, mo there's no way, my friends, that, that, that Cuba can be ignored. It's been praised by the World Health Organization and the United Nations and even the U.S., um, the New York Times, who else, the U.S. UN Ambassador, um, Samantha Powers, has had to give credit to uh, the Cuban physicians fighting Ebola, the UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon and Secretary of State John Kerry, among the growing list of people who've been um, praising Cuba's efforts to fight Ebola. We don't need to hear their praise to really um, understand what Cuba has done for the world community, because this is not the first time that Cuba has been on the front lines. Uh, we know that fighting Ebola in West Africa is not the first example of Cuba's commitment to sharing in its expertise in social medicine. And the, the list is, goes on and on. But you know, Cuba has been in Nicaragua in the 70s, uh, in Honduras and Guatemala and Haiti following 1998's Hurricane Mitch and Hurricane Georges. Cuba provided long-term care for 18,000 victims of Chernobyl 
and um, offering treatment for a variety of different uh, disorders connected with uh, radioactivity. The uh, 2004 Asian tsunami, Cuba was there. Hurricane uh, Katrina, Cuba tried to be there, but the U.S. government said no. Those same forces wound up in uh, Pakistan following uh, the earthquake there. So there's been countless you know, examples of the way that Cuba has risen uh, to the top in terms of providing its, its medical care. And of course, we can't forget the fact that Cuba continues to provide uh, uh, medical scholarships to thousands and thousands of people from uh, various countries, uh, free scholarships to uh, become physicians with the understanding that they'll return home and practice in underserved communities. To date, there have been more than 112 graduates from the U.S. There's more than 107 currently practicing, and about 50 of them are in residency or practicing medicine. That's the kind of gift that Cuba has given. But it's that example, it's that, 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 that powerful uh, model that Cuba is uh, so known for and is providing um, on the ground in West Africa. Uh, so I just wanted to take a moment and really, there are plenty of other people who can speak to the, the, the details of uh, the impact that the Ebola crisis is having um, in West Africa. I wanted to make sure that we had some clarity and understanding about the role that um, our Cuban comrades have been playing uh, in, in this fight. These are just some of the examples of its commitment to the world despite being blockaded by the so-called most powerful nation in the world. Uh, so I want to just end by saying that not only will we continue to be in solidarity with the efforts in, uh, that Cuba is um, engaging in, not only will we continue to try to look at creative ways to really be supportive of the efforts to fight this, this deadly disease, but I want to take a page out of uh, Margaret, Dr. Margaret Stevens' book and, and, and ask and challenge us, how do we how do we get through? How do we, how do we rise above those, those obstacles? I know my time is up. I just want to say very quickly, if Go Pastors for Peace, we organize caravans of humanitarian aid. Many of you know this. We've done that in various parts of the world. Ironically, in the very uh, early 1970s, did a lot of that work um, in, in Africa. One of the challenges that we face is we think about how, do we be, how can we provide support for our, our brothers and sisters there is how do we get beyond that 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 the, the level of, of um, help me with the word um, the 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 I'm just trying to the the, the the not the vision but you're saying that, that that there's there's really people on the ground that we can't actually reach out to that we can't network with that we can't work with because of the, the dishonesty and the distrust and the the corruption thank you I don't know. you know the graft that thank you see dr stevens has, has helped me tonight that's what i, I want to i want this to be in, in uh, a learning lesson how do we, we we've got resources we understand how to do caravans we understand how to try to figure out ways to bring um, assistance and education to, to people here in the u.s uh, to help bring aid where it's, it's needed but how do we get beyond that corruption and the 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 graft that's on the ground in the country so that we can identify partners that we can actually partner with that's the challenge that you know that frustrates me that frustrates us at IFCO as we think about you know how is it that we do take the resources that we here have um, in the United States to uh, bring to our brothers and sisters there so I, I leave with that question and I and look forward to talking to any of you around the edges um, uh, the rest of this evening about ways that we figure out how we we get to the bottom of this thank you Good evening. Let's give it up for all of our speakers. And I'd like to add, let's give it up for Cuba. Um, my proposal, Gil, is a citizen's movement from one person to another in those areas, trusted citizens. 
But anyway, I'm reminded of uh, this uh, prophetic word, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. Meaning that the Cubans are, do, are indeed prophets in the medical world and we hope that we can acknowledge that. Uh, and we are also reminded about the words that Halle Selassie spoke and, uh, and uh, Bob Marley sang to until the day that the philosophy that holds one race superior and the other inferior is totally and permanently abandoned. Every day is going to be just not Ebola, but war and distinction. So let us be reminded of that. At this time, I'm not, I have the opportunity to introduce this guy. When I saw his name, I, I, I was wondering whether he was the world famous boxer. But it told me he's, he's not. And I was happy because I said, maybe I'll be meeting one of the, I mean, I'm not a big boxing fan, but I know I watch this guy fight once upon a time. But he's from the People's Power Assembly. And he, indeed, perhaps with the name, the People's Power Assembly, he is a powerful boxer. So please welcome Mr. Larry Holmes. <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint the brother, <laughs> but uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, sisters and brothers, comrades and friends, I, I think Dr. Stevens made an analysis very briefly, but it was so true and you don't hear it. The fact of the matter is that black lives do not matter to imperialism. They do not matter to colonialism. It's not just stupidity or some subjective thing or individuals in hierarchical places. It's the fact that if the system cannot exploit some people, then their lives are expendable. Therefore, you have criminal neglect in relationship to Ebola. Therefore, the police can wage a lethal war against our black and brown youth because their lives are expendable because they can't be exploited to make the rich richer. It's one of the reasons why one of the slogans that I love in these demonstrations that have just flourished all over the country is uh, Eric Gardner, Michael Brown, tear the whole system down. It's funny how people's consciousness, at a certain time, people could just, their consciousness seems paralyzed, seems stagnant. Some of us veterans of the struggle, we began to wonder, you know, why are the people not moving? You know, all these terrible things. And then all of a sudden, their consciousness just shoots up into the sky. And they, it's as though they've gotten a century worth of political consciousness in the course of a few days or a short period of time. Something is happening, sisters and brothers. There is a turning point here. People have been out in the streets every day for almost two weeks. First in reaction to the Ferguson grand jury. That was two weeks ago and then in reaction to the Staten Island grand jury. Out in the streets in more than a hundred cities, in the thousands, blocking interstate highways, shutting down Amtrak trains, going into Grand Central Station, going to airports, going into Macy's, going into Apple stores and having die-ins, being out there at the Barclay Center last night with the royal couple and so forth, you know? Uh, hands up, don't shoot, I can't breathe. In every part of the country, I can't remember when we've seen something like this. I mean, we don't want anyone to have to die, to have to be martyred. But I'll tell you something, Michael Brown and Eric Gardner, they did not die in vain. They did not die in vain. Because for some reason, after all the names that we can go down, John Bell, Ramali Graham, Amadou, for some reason, it took these two men, the lynching 
of these two men for people to say, that's it. Enough is enough. All I want to just reinforce, and I'm speaking to soldiers here, I recognize many of you as being veterans in the struggle, is that we have an obligation now. We have to support this uprising. That's really what it is. It's a nationwide uprising against this police war on young black and brown people. Not exclusively young black and brown people, but mostly. It's, it's an uprising. And we are obligated to find ways to support it. We can come together and talk about it at the People's Power Assembly. We'll be meeting tomorrow night at 7. It's on that slip of paper, 124 West 24th Street. We can come and talk about it. There'll be a lot of people there. A lot of the young people will be there. We've got the demonstrations that uh, 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 Lilani already announced. Uh, tomorrow, uh, 4 o'clock, 42 Vanderbilt, which is right next to Grand Central Station. Uh, that's where there'll be some bourgeois think, type, think tank seminar on, on uh, broken windows. And that's really, you know, what killed uh, Eric Gardner, you know, picking up people on these petty crimes and killing them, you know. The following day at 1 on Thursday, somebody is giving Police Commissioner Bratton an award. I mean, what is up with that? And that's at 1 o'clock, and that's actually on 14th Street and 5th Avenue, 85th Avenue. There's the big Millions March for Justice on Saturday, 2 p.m., Washington Square Park. Some of us are, are talking about targeting Martin Luther King's birthday, not the holiday, his actual birthday, January 15th, because that's a working day, that's a Thursday, as a day when we have a citywide strike, where we shut all shopping down, where we just shut the whole city down. Some of us need a little more time than some of the young people who are just tweeting each other, show up at Macy's, we're going to do a dying. Some of us, you know, are a little old fashioned, a little old school. We need a little more time. We have got to challenge ourselves. What these young people have done is they have promised themselves and they have promised the world, they have promised the families of the martyr that we are not going to stop until something changes. This is it. If it has to be day after day, whatever, if we have to invade police stations, you know, if, whatever we have to do, they are doing it. Thank goodness, hallelujah, we haven't seen it in a while. Now let's figure out a way for us to weigh in and help spread this movement and make it even bigger for those folks who for one or another reason haven't had the opportunity to get in it. Thank you. Hands up. Hands up. Well, you see he can box with his mouth. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me just remind you that uh, fifth, about some 15 years ago not 15, almost 20 years ago, we had another killing on Staten Island in the person of Ernest Sion. He was also a Liberian. So we just were reminded that these things continue to happen and um, it don't just stop until we fight. So, uh, Brother Holmes, I agree with you. Uh, this time it's, it gives me my, my, a pleasure. It's not, it's not very often you get to introduce your own president. So I have the privilege to introduce somebody that I've worked with for the over 24 years. Um, she happens to be my aunt-in-law, I'm married to her, uh, her husband's uh, uh, niece. And uh, she's a dynamic woman who's been fighting uh, for what we call Little Liberia in uh, Staten Island and of course the African community. She assumed the presidency of the Liberian community two and a half years ago and her goal was to bring unity to the Liberian community on Staten Island. And for some fate and some miracle purpose, Ebola has helped her to do that. So sisters and brothers, please welcome Mrs. Orita Bessman, yes, the president of the Staten Island Liberian Community Association. Oh my God. 
it is tough. I have a little clip I asked uh, the person in charge of the uh, video to show that to us. My heart is heavy. As I stand before you, I have to do this bravely because it is not an easy task to undertake at this time, more especially, like we say, our young black men are being murdered like animals. And then in West Africa, we have the enemy that we don't even see killing our people. And then you watch the news and you see asses cutting people heads off and you wonder what is going on around us in the world today. But I start by here to give you a little history and to also encourage us. Like my country national anthem says, in union strong, success is sure. This is the video that I got, our pictures I got from Liberia. That's the after effect of Ebola, where parents had died and left their young children and no one to care for them. And they are eating from the city dumpsters, garbages. There's a nurse, she one of the first that contracted the Ebola virus and died and left a three-year-old child in Liberia. And this old man, he was sick. The wife took him to the hospital. They denied his service, and he sat in the street and died while sitting there from Ebola. These are the things that are going on in West Africa. People are being treated like animals. We even respect animals, then we respect people. And human lives do matter. Wow. This is a friend my husband went to college. We are the Science College. He died from Ebola, uh, Mr. Kumaya. And this little boy you're looking at, his parents died, and he was the only survivor of Ebola. He's going home with his certificate in his hands that he's Ebola free. But the community would not accept him, and he wanted those not eating from city dumpsters. And there's an old lady standing, sitting begging for food. She's blind. All her children have died. She's in the street begging, while people standing in the line waiting for food. And nobody to even look at her or help her to the line to get her food. The mothers, concerned Liberian mothers in the United States got together. And right now, I just come to say, we are all in this together. This is not an African problem. This is not a West African problem. This is a global problem. And if we don't tackle it at its source, it's coming home to us here in the United States. We've seen it when Eric Duncan came to Texas. They, ha they didn't know he had Ebola enter the country, even though the news said he knew it, not a doctor, help a pregnant woman, like we see the young man sitting there, hospital denied him service, the wife took him to the uh, pharmacy to ask for help, pharmacy denied him service, he sat there and died. It was a case with the guy in Texas. He helped a seven months old pregnant woman that was bleeding and crying from stomach pain. All he knew he helped another human being that was dying. He didn't know she had Ebola. Three days later, he came to America, and the whole world had it that he brought Ebola to America and lied on the phone. And no doctor accepted her to tell him she had Ebola. All he knew was a pregnant woman that died from complication to the pregnancy. So these are the things that happen in West Africa. Our children are hungry. Our people are dying. Our hearts are heavy. On Staten Island alone, 
One of the ministers lost 16 members of his family to Ebola. People lost 9, 10, 12, 7, 2, 3. The news coming every day. But this is what the, the healthcare workers did in Liberia. In Africa right now, about 20% of the healthcare workers died from Ebola because all they thought they were doing, they were caring for malaria patients, not knowing it was Ebola. <clears throat> so what we started to do on Staten Island is to encourage our Africans, get your flu shots. You don't want to go to the hospital and you are told it's because of Ebola and put you to the side and die from just a common flu and why they treat you like Ebola patient. We've seen it happen in Brooklyn with the lady at the health desk dressing place. Before they got to her, they quarantined the whole place, she had a high attack. She didn't have Ebola. So we try to encourage each and every one of us to even do that. But I come to say, the Staten Island Liberian community right now, we are working on a, a 44 container of food to send to Liberia. I know my time is up, but this is very sensitive. We're working on a 44 container to send food to feed the hungry children, the orphans that are the vic victim. And I have volunteered myself to go with the container because I want for those that don't have the way to get to the city to get food to eat. So I'm using myself to go. <laughs> the container is being packed now on Staten Island. We're asking everyone to help us any way you can help us. If you can help to save one person's life, you play your part. So that's what we are doing. I'm going to the library with a container, and I'm going to make sure I reach the remote area, because that's where people are dying the most. The city is free. So I just come to say, we need your help any way you can help us. As for me, I'm already, because of Ebola, I'm out of my job. Since July, I went to Africa and came back. They took me off my schedule. I have not work because of Ebola. And my job now is embarrassed to call me back because of the shame. So I just come to say thank you to you all, Brother Johnny Stevens, and the committee. We just want to say thank you and all those that left your business schedule on the Tuesday evening to be here. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are going to be passing buckets around right now. If anyone can contribute anything to the effort that the sister was just talked about, please give as generously as you can. Um, we are now going to have a little uh, musical interlude. Uh, I'd like to invite Rodney Stone and the Groundbreakers to come up. They've, they've uh, done a song on Ebola. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rodney C. Stone, and I'm a hip-hop pioneer. And this is Cut King. It's MC Happy. And we call ourselves the Groundbreakers. Great. I want to take a few moments to speak directly to you on what's happening, especially in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Ghana. Because we are the Groundbreakers. We are I'm <laughs> 
want you to know and to understand. Ebola is death, a plague against man. Divided we fall, united we stand. We must work together to heal the land. There's no time for us to grandstand. We must unite hand in hand. Cause people of the world are racing and chasing. Not too sure about what we're facing. Leaders of the world must stop mocking. While people in Africa are steady dying. The story starts. The way it will end is the human race. We must defend. Groundbreakers came to share information to help educate the world population. Ebola is the total conversation. Save the lives is the final destination. What is this? Another outbreak. How much could we take in Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone? This is a death sentence that they're home alone. All the hell is crying. Ebola tears were being used and abused for so many years. The devil's call back against the wall. A me and more people are likely to fall. Ebola death sentence find the way out. Teach and preach of what Ebola's about. And I use my pen to open up your eyes on a fire. All these people have to die. Love and respect. If you hear my voice, I want to save lives. And that's my choice. You got to know the whole world is attached to you. And we can hear you screaming in Africa. 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 sisters and brothers. Uh, first, uh, please join me in saluting the heroic health workers of Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and, and the international volunteers of Cuba, the, uh, from other parts of Africa, the Doctors Without Borders, the Partners in Health, and so many others who are really heroes, who are sacrificing their lives, suffering very large casualties. And some have fallen, some have survived, and others continue. And they have to be not only respected, they have to be honored and treated with the kind of dignity and also given the support that they need because they're fighting for all of us. It's been said several times that to the racist police, the racist courts, the politicians, and the bankers that they work for, that to them, black lives don't matter. 
and in the same way to the pharmaceutical companies, the big drug companies, who should have been working on a vaccine, who should have been working on treatments for this virus since 1979, when it was first uncovered, before even AIDS and HIV were, was known, known, Ebola was known, and they did nothing, because to them, it was a black disease, an African disease, a poor people's disease. And they would rather spend millions and billions for male pattern baldness or for erectile dysfunction or anything else that will bring them profits. But they will not spend, whether for malaria or tuberculosis or AIDS or Ebola or what they call tropical diseases, what, but what they mean is poor people's diseases, rural people's diseases, the diseases affecting the peoples of Africa, Latin America, Asia, and they don't give a damn unless they can make profit. Now, until there is a, vi a vaccine and until there is a treatment, the only way to fight this virus really is isolation and quarantine. Now, just to separate it, isolation, isolation means those who are sick and who are already sick and trying to prevent it from spreading. Quarantine are those who might be exposed, who might be sick. But the problem, the problem with the isolation and quarantine, the way it's done now, it's being done as punishment. It's being done out of fear. And what needs to be done is recognizing that the people who have to go into isolation and or into quarantine should be encouraged, rewarded, treated as heroes just like the healthcare workers because by doing that, by pulling themselves out from the population, they are saving all, everyone else's lives. They are sacrificing their well-being in order to save others. And how do you do that? How do you do it both humanely and in a way that people want to do it, not being forced to do it by the police and the army? That's exactly right. Because they go missing because they're not given the resources. They're not given the money for themselves and their families to take care of them. So they're afraid of quarantine. They're afraid of isolation because no one is providing for them or their families. They're not treated with the respect they need and no one gives a goddamn about what their conditions are. So if we're gonna turn this around, if we're gonna stop the epidemic until there's a, a vaccine and a treatment, we have to have resources not, as was said, not the 400 beds, that's absurd. There has to be quality, quality places for the sick where they feel that they're better off than dying at home. And maybe they, right now, many don't feel that way. There have to be quality places, support for those who, are, who should be in quarantine, but who rightfully are afraid because what's going to happen to them? What's going to happen to their loved ones when, when they're the breadwinners. We need billions. This is a, a world emergency that needs an emergency response, and we need to demand not this paltry, you know, token stuff, not sending troops when you can send doctors, and even the troops who are supposed to build resources, they don't need American troops to dig ditches or put up walls. There are lots of African workers who would be willing to do it if you paid them. Send the money and pay them and the materials so they can have the resources. If we want to fight the disease, we, we have to also fight the disease that puts profits ahead of people. And the capitalist imperialist system that puts profit in front of people, that is the disease that underlies all of these diseases and the other diseases that go with it, including racist violence.
Thank you, doctor. And don't, don't forget to keep passing that money in the bucket. You know, we need to remind you about it. And if you still have your checks to write, please write out for the donation uh, for Liberia. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, I want to bring in somebody who I have worked with for over 10 years. Uh, he's no stranger to fighting for justice. He's no stranger to fighting for uh, the voiceless. Uh, this young man is a member of the powerful local TWU, the local that uh, uh, made, made sure that people heard their voices some 10 years ago on Christmas season, and he was at the front of this thing happening to make sure that the working people have, I mean, have their benefits and their trust. So in New York City, you all you should know that we're fighting, and while we're fighting for ourselves here, I want to thank you, our sisters and brothers here, who are fighting for us in Africa. Uh, he's also, he's now the current president of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists of, in New York City, and he sits on the international board of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists uh, in the United States. Please welcome the president of the New York City CBTU chapter, Brother Charles Jenkins. Greetings, greetings, and good evening. Uh, greetings to my brother, Tobuk, uh, as, uh, uh, who I've had, uh, as he just mentioned, the pleasure of working with around the struggle uh, for the last 10 years. But not only uh, uh, in this here organization that I'm the president of the Coalition of Black Trade Unions, when I'm going to bring some greetings, but also in the labor movement, in the labor movement, fighting for workers. Uh, and that's with this here crisis is. This crisis affects us workers. Uh, it doesn't identify us uh, by the color of our skin. Uh, it identifies us uh, as our class. And don't none of us here uh, own anything. Uh, we're no CEOs. We don't make the policies. Uh, we fight against them. Uh, so AIDS, Ebola, Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, those are all lives. Whether it's killed by a planet disease or by racist cops. The slogan that's clearly put up here, Black Lives Matter. I want to come and bring you a message to connect what was said by so many speakers. How can we unite and support? I say we have to use resources to fight back. We have to demonstrate, we have to protest to fight back. We see it going on all around this here country. There's a sister that just spoke here that said she's been denied returning to work. Interesting. Just by the color of our skin, we get stopped. Now, we may deny you to go to work. In this country, that claims it's the land of the free, the land of opportunity. I got to say, Brother Toba, this is my country, and I'm ashamed in the way they treat not only us that live in this here country, but those that come and service this here country. So it's folks like you and I. It's folks like organizations that I belong to, the Coalition of Black Trade Unions, uh, T, uh, TWU Local 100, a union organization where we have resources to help band for our own struggle and for our own fight. The importance of me being here tonight is that I sit on the international 
board of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists that has taken up the question on health, health care in this country. And so I will identify and appoint somebody in New York, in my chapter, to head up the crises around Ebola. Right here. That's the power we have. So when we sit in high places, it's to deal with the issues that are affecting us as a people. And you have my support from the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists and from TW Local 100 for us to unite and do more and do more and in solidarity with everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brother Jenkins, and thank the trade union movement and workers everywhere. Uh, this time we're going to be entertained. And, um, you know, we, when you sing the Liberian National Anthem, there's a, there's a part that say, in joy and gladness, with our hearts united, we will overall prevail. But there's a part in Liberia we always joke and say, enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. You know, enjoying is a part of the Liberian way. At night, when we were growing up, we'd sit under the, 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 the moonlights and the stars, and we'll tell stories. And some of us sing our songs and dance. And um, this young man, I met him uh, in 2010 when I went to Liberia to help with the presidential election that brought the first female president of Africa to office in the person of Madam Ellen Johnson Salif. And this guy, when, when I met him, they said he was, I mean, he was so shy. And they said he was the leading vocalist in the country. And I said to myself, I mean, this guy is so shy, he can't, be, I mean, he don't talk much. He sit back and, you know, and, 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 and let me just say, for just, I know this is a serious moment, but just to throw a little light to it, you know, all these uh, stars, you know, they got all these girls looking to come around and talk to them and stuff like that. So he, he there, you know, and people looking, for, I mean, people trying to come to talk to him. He's sitting in the corner by himself and not saying much. But then when he came to perform, I knew why they said he was the, um, he was the leading uh, vocalist in the country. So sisters and brothers, I've heard him sing. I give you the opportunity to listen to a very polite, intelligent young man who is here this evening all the way from Liberia, visiting with us in the United States. Uh, we bring you from Monrovia to New York City, Mr. David Mel. Good evening, everybody. Um, one morning, that was last month, I was on the internet and I got early in the morning by 5, 5 a.m. And I saw the photo of one of my best friends. He's a journalist and he contributed towards my success. And I saw his photo on the internet that he was dead because of Ebola. And that was a difficult time in my life. So I went back to write this song and I want to share this song with you. I titled this song, Prayer Against Ebola. Can we all say that? Prayer Against Ebola. Prayer Against Ebola. Yeah, let's go. <clears throat> Sorry. Reading the news about a three years of all lying down in the pool of blood. When I got to the saint and asked the people to say, This is Ebola, Ebola. Mm. It's killing my people, it's taking away the future generation. But I keep my hands to the heaven and say, Yeah. We pray. I said, we pray. Wipe the tears from the people's eyes. Remove the dark cloud. Let the live in good health. Destroy this Ebola. Ebola, hey. 
If you believe it, with those hands, let me see ya. Yeah. Oh, sift my people. Yeah. All I can see is fears in the eyes of the children. All I can see, the future generation is going away. I see the doctors, the nurses, they are dying. I said my papa, my oma, my sister, and my brabi. Don't you be afraid. If you believe it, if you believe we can say. Everybody, y'all, put your hands up, though. Yeah. We pray. Oh, I said my people, we pray. Wipe the tears from the people's eyes. Remove the dark cloud and let them live. In good health, this strong, this Ebola, Ebola, Ebola head. Oh, 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 yeah. I say, my people, don't you be afraid. Yeah, hey, see, I'm calling on the whole world the UN, the AU, and the EU. See, come to Africa. And give the people hope, yeah. And let the children live and see, say, yo. Oh, oh, oh. I said, my people, we pray. Oh, yeah. I said, my people, my people, we pray. Oh, yeah. I said, I said, my people, my people, we pray. Remove the dark cloud. Remove the dark cloud. Oh. Take away this Ebola. Yeah. Take away this Ebola. Yeah. Take away this Ebola. Let them see what it is from the people's eyes. Remove the dark cloud. Let them live in good health. Destroy this Ebola. Yeah. Ebola, hey. Oh, yeah. The people need your help. Oh, yeah. See, us. You will live to see another day, another day, another year. If you believe it, yeah, see, we're gonna make it. Jehovah, remove the dark cloud. Ooh, yeah. See now, everything's gonna be alright. Yeah, listen, everything's gonna be alright. Yeah, if you believe it, say, everything's gonna be alright. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we just want to remind folks once again, um, if you would like to write a check to, 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 uh, to support the effort tonight, they can be written to, written to SILCA, which is the Staten Island Librarian Community Association, but you can just write S-I-L-C-A, Ebola funds, on the check. Um, we'll, we'll collect those in there. And there will also be a benefit in Staten Island on January 31st. Um, we do have a, a couple more speakers, and then we're going to close this out. Um, uh, next, we're going to hear from Donat Bukuba, who's from the Rwandan community in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. Donat. Uh, mine is going to be very short because I'm very angry and uh, a little more. I, have, I actually have to thank a few people. Uh, Dr. Stevens, who was here, and um, the sister. Um, uh, Gail, which I had a privilege to work with your father, and I work with you on the Cuban walks. I know exactly what you're capable of doing, and uh, but uh, more likely I need to speak on Ebola. Ebola basically it was kind of something that came uh, out of nowhere in Africa. We would not expect this thing to happen in Africa. We we didn't even recognize that virus had come to Africa. Uh, recently, uh, some of you have heard some children from Rwanda who was refused to go to the elementary school. Uh, these are like four, five, six years old kids 
who were not exposed, they were not even close to Ebola, they never been even near Ebola, but to see that the school itself uh, put these kids uh, uh, to a, a program that they have to stay home and study from their house, stay there for 21 years without going to class, to make sure that these kids don't have the virus. It, it, it's, it's not just inhumane, but I think it's more disrespectful to Africans. Uh, uh, you cannot just take all Africans, think that every single African who just came from Africa has been exposed or he has Ebola. Having said that, also uh, something that I'm going to touch on very briefly, it's about the help that we get from the United States. Uh, the, 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 what they said, uh, Dr. Margaret said that earlier, and I was very angry and pissed but peace is to a point where there's nothing I can do about it, but just good to know about it. The help that we got from the US, they send these soldiers, Marines, and these guys came with guns. What is guns had to do with Ebola? Is a gun gonna really cure? Is a new vaccine when they shoot you with it? And the Ebola gonna stop? And you see this, the, this army that they say that they're gonna build something somewhere as a hospital, and they're like in full gear. I mean, it's like they were going to war. They were jumping into helicopters. They were standing with gun pointing. They have all these things on the back of their, uh, uh, like, 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 a, like grenade or some stuff. So it was really disrespectful to Africans. And but on the other side, I'm gonna speak a little bit on African, as Africans who are here today. We Africans of diaspora, we here in America, but it's something that we always forget, is to get together as Africans and talk about Africa. I see so many faces here from Africa I never met. I didn't even know there was a Liberian community in Staten Island. I go hang out in Staten Island a lot. I go to Harlem to eat a lot. And I don't know where all these African community organizations are. We have our own community organization. I never invite you because I don't know you exist. I don't know you, where you are, I don't know how to contact you. So we need to find a way to identify ourselves where we are within our community. You have an event, you invite my community. I have an event, I invite your community. So we get to know each other. The sister from Africa was talking about how she's going to do a fundraising to bring food to the needy, to try to have a container. I didn't know about that till today. Now I have to go to my community and try to organize that. How much time do I have? I don't know. But it's a wonderful thing when something like this happens. We Africans have to be forefront first. Our brothers, African-Americans, we love you. We, we know how kind of work we've been doing. But we Africans, we have to be first in the front. And our brothers and sisters here in America, they have to support us on that behalf. So having said that, I thank every single one of you who came here today. And I also have to thank Johnny Stevens for organizing these events, which is very, very, very important. Which uh, so we, we hope we have this more and we hope that we're going to have to get together. We hope we're going to help the sister try to get as many containers as possible to take home to those needies. Thank you everyone. Africa is truly in the house. And we are in, we are in Africa in New, in New York, huh? How long? I mean, you're acting like we're not in Africa. This is Africa in New York, isn't it so? All right, I know that, because I, 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 I told my, my history of telling me wrong. You know, let me just tell you a short story before I, a short two-second two story. I have a cousin who, uh, he came here back in the uh, 70s, and when he went back home, he, you know, used to boast of being uh, in Harlem, 125th Street down to 110th Street. And he said, if you ever go to America and you never went to 125th Street, then you have not been to America. So the first place I came 
when I came to America was 125th Street. And Johnny, I tell you, I'm in, Amer I'm, in, I'm in America and I'm in Africa. You know, so I'm happy to be here in New York City and in Harlem and in the Black Theater. Yeah. The Black Theater. You know, that's a wonderful thing. But anyway, it's, it's not too often that you, you have the opportunity to introduce the guy who put the program together. So at this time, I have the honor to introduce the guy who have been fighting along with us across the city. Johnny Stevens have been uh, with us in every place we've been. He's helped us to advertise this thing. He's helped us to put a face to the Ebola. He's helped us to get connected with people. And it is my pleasure to not int to introduce to you a very popular person that you already know who needs no introduction, our brother Johnny Stevens. He said, fight Ebola, fight stigma, fight racism. We need money to fight Ebola and not wars. Tonight's program is another step in solidarity with our African community, with our health care workers, with our cultural workers, as David and Groundbreakers. We want to thank the photographers who are here tonight, who are doing the video, because this is work that we're going to put in, like Dr. Stevenson was saying with the radio, to fight this Ebola. And we know that we're not just fighting a virus, because like Dr. Hello said, the United States government canceled the bill, the United States Congress, to create a vaccine in 2001. But now, six out of 13 West African states constituting millions and millions of people, billions and billions of resources, now is popular because they can make money to come about. Now they will do it. We have to fight this. It's urgent that we fight this. And I'm so happy, like Brother Mandela said at Robin Island, we were like the Sierra Leones. We like the Guineans. We like the Liberians. We like the healthcare workers. We like the community. We have become a fist. And we will crush Ebola. We will crush racism. And we will crush this stigma. And you can't say enough about everyone who was here because we know that all that's going to go back out to create more work. We know we're going to be in touch. I've had an opportunity to go to Staten Island. And on Staten Island, just like Ilani mentioned, we work with Eric Garner family. We work with Rodney um, um, Ramsey Oda, who shot the video family. We have youth who work around um, uh, Eric Garner, who is Liberian. These youth face everyday racism, not only about Ebola, but they face racism just from being in the street and don't having unemployment. The temporary protected status. This is an ongoing military assault to make money. Broken Arrow is a policy of racism, of hunting down and destruction. And this is what's happening, not only in the community fighting for that service, but this is what's happening with the youth there. Beyond, like Sister Reese was saying, you cannot say enough about the community who are most affected with this terrible virus of phone calls coming in every day. When I call them and I don't get an answer, when I call them and they said, I'll get back to you right away, I know the crisis is severe. I start saying, I hope no one hasn't died. I start saying, how could we do more? Because I know it's a crisis, and most often you can't always act as a community who are most affected to do more. We got to get with them and do more. And the groups that we had here tonight, and I would say that we had a guest here from the National Nurses, um, statewide, New York Statewide Nurses Association, uh, Sister Karen Jarrett, who is collecting supplies to go to Liberia this month. She had to leave, and they couldn't speak. But I'd like to let you know, people is, were among us who have come 
to work. So I'd like to thank everybody being in touch with the International Action Center. It's most rewarding to be able to work with the Liberian, the Sierra Leone, and the Guinean community against British, French, and U.S. colonialism to actually fight Ebola, to stand in solidarity with for jobs, human rights, and justice. It's an honor. So please be in touch with us. And we'd like to say finally that this meeting was co-sponsored by the Africa Ebola Crisis Committee, which is a coalition of the three West African group most affected. We have got calls and solidarity messages from Kini Bafini Faso, from Ghanaian organization, like Iwandan. So we're not saying, but we're saying this coalition for the better of all of West Africa and healthcare workers have came together as a coalition because most often they want you to go along. Most often they want you to say, oh, this is Liberia, or this is Guinean, and this is, you know, Sierra Leone, and your work is dying almost immediately from that particular point. By us starting off with a coalition, by us starting off with health care, by us starting off with the National Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, by us starting off with ACT UP and so forth, we have a real coalition and we ask you to follow that. And I will say like Gail said, Black Lives Matters from West Africa to Staten Island to Ferguson. Thank you. Uh, good evening once again. <clears throat> My name is Rodney Stone, but I'm professionally known as Rodney C. I'm one half of the original Double Trouble. I was featured in the first hip hop, break dance, and graffiti movie ever created. It was called Wild Style. It's considered the Bible of rap and opened the doors for all the movies and things going on today. In addition to that, I'm also one fifth member of the Funky Four plus one more and the Funky Four plus one. We were the very first hip hop group from the Bronx to get a legitimate record deal. We were the very first hip hop group with a female. Her name is Shah Rock, and she is the first female of hip hop. And we were the very first hip hop group to do national television. We did Saturday Night Live with Deborah Harry on Valentine's Day, 1981. I am, yeah, y'all can clap. These days I wear a few hats but the one that I'm most proud of is I am the executive director of the Groundbreakers. And the Groundbreakers are a handful of original hip hop pioneers who had came together for one common cause. And that was to raise awareness and to raise money for a medical health and dental care program for hip hop pioneers and their immediate families. But when this Ebola thing came about, this became real important. So this is what we decided to put our energies into. And we produced two songs about Ebola, and we about to do this second song for you. And before I go, I want to introduce Cut King, who is the official DJ for the Groundbreakers, and no other than my brother from another mother, MC Happy. You this song here is called No Fear. We don't want the American people to feel this thing we call Ebola. We want you to educate yourself on it. Shout out to Allison Williams singing in the background. Peter Wayne. doesn't discriminate. It's a deadly disease that we all must hate. On this fact, there's no debate. A real remedy we must create. Medications must be sent. So Ebola deaths we can prevent. Commitment from the government to send Africa the best equipment. So many in the world are affected. So many are being misdirected. The misinformation must be corrected to guarantee that we're all protected. As I walk through the valley of an African nation, all I see is fear and desperation to help keep the homes workers safe. The government must participate. Cut King! Let's go. 
There's over 7,000 orphan children in West Africa, and them, pe them children need to be fed. So y'all send your $2, all right? Let's get it. Thank you, man. R.C. Love, R.C. Stone, and the Groundbreakers. Thank you. I said I was going to be the last, I mean, I was going to be coming on the last, but you know, when they, when, you're, when they give you directive, you have to do it. I learned that one of our speakers uh, just walk in, and he's going to be keeping us for three minutes, and we're going to... We're going to keep you on that time. But before I, I do that, let us thank our uh, uh, sound director, Abel. He just came in walking and took over the sound. You know, he was not prepared to do it, but he did a wonderful job. So, Abel, thank you, brother. Uh, we want to, at this time, bring on the president of the People's Organization for Progress, Mr. Larry Ham. Power to the people. It's late, and I'm going to be less than three minutes. <laughs> uh, Ebola is a deadly disease, and we, we must do all that we can to aid our brothers and sisters in Africa, in West Africa, to fight this deadly disease. But brothers and sisters, there are diseases more deadly than Ebola. Racism is a deadly disease. Colonialism is a deadly disease. Imperialism is a deadly disease. Capitalism is a deadly disease. And these diseases kill more people every day than Ebola is killing. And I don't say that to make light of the deaths that have been caused by this disease. But let there be no mistake about it. The 
the spread of Ebola in West Africa is really a manifestation of a deeper problem. And that is the problem of underdevelopment that has been caused by the super exploitation of the people and their resources in West Africa. I was appalled to hear that there were hospitals that did not have running water. I was like, how could you have a hospital without running water? And I thought for a minute that this was just a problem in West Africa, in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, in Guinea. But then, when we were faced with a couple of cases of Ebola here in the United States, we might have had running water, but our hospitals did not have the equipment and the materials that the people needed to handle those who were infected with Ebola. So this is a problem that affects folks in West Africa, and this is a problem that affects folks here because it's not just a question of the underdevelopment of Africa, it's a question of the underdevelopment of communities of color here in the United States. So I just want to end on that note. We're fighting this disease on both sides of the Atlantic, but we're fighting these other diseases too. Racism, capitalism, and imperialism. And these are at the root of the rest of the problems that we face in this country today. And we must unite, brothers and sisters. There's no reason, you know, no hot and cold running water, no equipment and materials over here. But whenever they have a war, they have enough materials, don't they? Whenever they have a war, there's enough bombs, aren't they? There's enough bullets, aren't they? There's enough machine guns, there's enough tanks. There's enough armored vehicles. There's enough jet fighters. Whenever it's something they need, there's enough of it. But when it comes to what we need, there's never enough of it. And that problem is going to exist until we make revolution here in the United States. And that is really the long-term solution to these problems of disease and malnourishment and hunger and starvation and illiteracy and want and privation and homelessness. These things do not have to exist in this world. They exist because it redounds to the benefit of a handful of the richest people in the world. This world order supports them. So we must build a new world order for the people all over the world for the people. Power to the people. Thank you, brothers and sisters.